Good evening, everyone. Hope you, you hope you had a good day. Our last keynote for the day is Terry Oda. She has a PhD in computer science with pub seven published uh, papers. She is currently working as a security researcher in Intel, and she has been awarded numerous awards. And just to name one of them is Google Anita Bog Scholarship. She is also an org admin for Python Software Foundation in GSOC. Terry, stage is yours, and I'll put your slides up right now. Hello, PyCon India. I hope you can hear me. I actually can't hear you, so we're gonna. This will be a little bit strange. Um, I'm sorry that we can't all be together today, but I'm coming to you live from very foggy and dark Portland. Well, just outside of Portland, Oregon. Uh, the sun hasn't risen here yet, and uh, it's a little bit uh, hard to breathe because of the fog. So I'm sorry. I've got a cup of water, and I'll do what I can. So if you look at the last couple of years of surveys of Python developers, you can see that what people are using Python for is slowly changing and evolving. So data analysis beat out web development a couple of years ago. And the thing that I think is really exciting to me is that machine learning is slowly pushing its way up there. So we're at the point where even if you uh, aren't doing machine learning now, and a lot of you are probably, uh, you're probably going to be looking at it in the next couple of years. There's a good chance you'll learn it. And even if you don't care about any of that, the rise of machine learning and Python together means that you're almost certainly going to be impacted by other people who are doing machine learning here, there, or anywhere. And that's super exciting. That's that's really, I'm really excited about it because I love machine learning and I love Python and they seem like a great fit for each other. But as much as I'm excited about it, I, I'm a little nervous. All right, <laughs> sorry, just checking my messages. Um, so I often joke to my friends that Python plus machine learning has created the endless September of machine learning. And if you've not heard this term before, it's an old one from the early days of the internet, when it used to be that people got online, uh, usually through a university. So every year in September, you'd get a new crop of students and the internet would be full of people who had no idea what they were doing and had foolish questions. And it was chaos for a month every year. And after about a month, people would sort of learn the ropes and learn the unspoken rules and things would settle down, which was fine up until 1993. And in 93, America Online did this big push to get as many people online as they could, you know, as many paying customers as, as, as they could get, garner by sending floppy disks with the program to as many people as they could. And it worked. And so all of a sudden, there were a lot of people online and more people online and more people online and more people online. And um, the older internet users were not very impressed with this. And they coined the term endless September to talk about the fact that it was just a never ending flood of new users and it never settled down again. That was it. That was the end of the internet as we know it. Um, but that doesn't mean it's the end of everything. However, what do I mean that Python has created the endless September for machine learning? Well, machine learning used to sort of work the same way. It used to be fairly academic. Uh, a lot of people came out of universities. You would have sort of a classical education, you might have mentors who you worked with who could tell you stories about things that did and didn't work. You'd read papers, you'd read books, you'd have sort of the same a little time to, to ramp up before you were sort of released into the world. Um, but that's not the case anymore. 
you can just go and search for how do I make a neural net and you get a little tutorial with TensorFlow and you're off and, and running. So there's a constant influx of new users, uh, new users without any sort of background history or anything to help them sort of move into the, the normal behavior, which of course has completely changed. You don't need to go to a university anymore. You don't need to take that compiler's course or learn Lisp before you, you're, you're in it. You, you can do machine learning. And before you assume that this whole talk is going to be about how terrible it is and we all should have learned Lisp, uh, let me tell you, I didn't learn Lisp either. Um, I, I'm really a big fan of getting into machine learning in slightly non-standard ways, although I did go the academic route. Um, I didn't learn Lisp. The reason I got into machine learning was because my friend Asad said, hey, uh, I'm taking this course. It looks kind of cool. You should join me. And I looked at the course, I'm like, oh, that does look kind of cool. Uh, but I didn't have the prerequisites. However, at sort of grad school level, that sort of thing doesn't necessarily matter as much. So I went to the prof and I said, in fact, I was still an undergrad at the time, but I went to the prof and said, well, I know this is a grad course and I know I don't actually have all the prereqs, but it sounds really interesting, do you mind? And he said, Oh yeah, it'll be fine. Uh, let me know if you get stuck and I can give you some pre-reading or lend you a book or something. And that was it. I, I was in the course and it was kind of life-changing to be completely honest. I was so excited about uh, the Swarm Intelligence course that I kind of accidentally went to grad school. No, nope, no, really, that's, that's really what happened. Um, the final project for that course, I developed a artificial immune system for spam, for junk email detection, uh, which was great for me. I, my parents are biochemists, so I spend a lot of time learning about biology and thinking about these things. Artificial immunology was totally fascinating. It gave me an excuse to flex all those biology muscles without having to actually like do lab work or spend hours and days waiting for my seedlings to grow. So um, it was pretty cool. And I got a paper published. I was still an undergrad, it was amazing. I, they paid for me to go to a conference in Chicago. I was so excited. But by the time I came around to graduate at the end of the year, the job market wasn't so good. And so the prof I was working with said, hey, you know, you've got most of a master's degree here. You just need to sort of, write a thesis, uh, why don't you take a year and, and do grad school? And so I did. And um, that's me. I have a master's in, uh, a bachelor's in mathematics, a master's in artificial intelligence, and a PhD in computer security. And the story about how I got into computer security, uh, honestly, isn't much more carefully planned out than the story of how I got into artificial intelligence. Uh, I actually got interested in computer security while I was in grad school when the skylight in the office that I had broke, poured water all over my desk. And this was a problem because I had student papers and stuff in there that I needed to keep locked up by the rules of the university. And so they assigned me a new desk in the and in a room that had had some space, which was the security lab. And I want to say it was like the first day I was there, but it was probably actually, you know, in the first week or the first month, uh, I came in one day and they had just put in a new security door for pass cards. And about half of the lab was trying to figure out how to get it to play weird noises and whether they could make it the the new door uh, which did have an option to alarm that find a way to make the new door play i think it was the star trek door opening noise and the other half of the lab was sitting on the floor outside the lab with the door closed trying to slide things under the door and trigger the motion sensor so that the door would open without them having to use their pass cards and I looked at this pile of hooligans that I was sharing some office space with and thought, wow, these are kind of my people. I should learn something about computer security. And so I did. 
So while we're talking about computer security, it's as good a time as anything. Well, well, while we're talking about security, it's as good a time as any to uh, give the standard legal disclaimer that uh, my employer recommends, which is this talk is all my opinion. Uh, it does not represent the views of my employer. Uh, I work for Intel where I do open source security. And I sort of like to joke that my job is uh, saying no and telling people they're, they're wrong because that is a portion of it. But actually a lot of my job is really about explaining things to people so that they can have the knowledge to do the right thing. And in, that, in my case, the right thing is to make things a little bit more secure. But let's get back to some machine learning. So I'm really glad that Python and machine learning go together. I'm really glad that lots of new people are getting into the field. That's super exciting to me. It always kind of bugged me that, that it took so long to get really published and everything. And it's amazing because with all of these tools that are more accessible, we're getting things like open data, which was very hard to find when I was when I was starting. We're getting more opportunities for collaboration, a lot of really new excitement in the field. But as I said, I'm also kind of nervous about it and I'm also kind of sad about it because say what you will about the academic environment, but I really enjoyed the part where I got to hear stories about machine learning that did or didn't work, problems that were thought to be intractable and turned out to be tractable. And that's that was a big portion of what really kept me going in the field through the, the parts where you have to learn all of the algorithms and well, not all of the algorithms, but you learn a lot of algorithms and you spend a lot of time tuning them. And I think telling those stories, hearing those stories and having some, some sense of the history of the field actually does make it a little bit better, not just for you because it's fun, but because it avoid, helps us avoid some mistakes. So as you may know, I also do a lot of volunteer work for the Python Software Foundation, uh, mentoring students for Google Summer of Code and running the program. So I really care about mentoring. And so rather than just whine that there's a lot of noobs in the field and it's kind of scary, I'd like to give you a bit of a master class in the parts of the machine learning education that you can't get by finding a, tuto a very goal-oriented tutorial on how to use TensorFlow. So uh, this is Dr. Terry's lecture on uh, machine learning, my master class on machine learning. And I even have a whiteboard here for you. So, so we're, uh, we're just going to do this thing. So Terry's law number one, your model is only as good as your data. So I guess you probably can't see, see my whiteboard right now, but um, the, it's up on the, the slide. And this one is pretty much self-explanatory. Garbage in, garbage out is sort of a part of the whole field of computer science. If you don't have great data, it's really hard to get anything meaningful. And then number two, is your data is always bad. So I don't mean that all of your data is bad, just that it's basically impossible to have perfect data. It's really easy for there to be some sort of way to manipulate the data through, for example, survey questions or who you poll. Uh, we, we often joke in uh, in North America, that a lot of our polls are done with phone calls, and the only people who answer phone calls are over 60, because the rest of us have caller ID and don't, don't bother and haven't really been trained for that. But um, there's a lot of ways that uh, data can be bad, and data, even when you have the best available data, may not be perfect. Uh, for example, medical data. It's true that m many drugs are tested only on men because drug companies don't want to deal with the, the issues that could, could be caused by hormone fluctuations. And so they don't test on women. So we have a lot, a lot of data that is more accessible now, but 
has some pretty big flaws that may or may not impact what you're trying to do. And then finally, uh, my last law, which is the one that sort of gets top billing in this presentation, is that algorithms cheat. And we're going to tell you some stories about how that happens and when it's really funny. So I wasn't really, uh, I don't really want to give you a whole course on what a machine learning algorithm is. You can look all that up, but here's a sort of rough flow of how most of the algorithms work. So you give it a, a task that you want it to do. We'll choose something simple. Today, we're going to talk about going and identifying a dog versus a cat. So what you do is you give your algorithm a bunch of examples. So this is a cat. I'd have 100 other ca cats. This is a dog. I've had 100 other dogs. Or you know maybe I just start with these ones. And so I look at them. I mean, the algorithm looks at them and tries to find features that make them into two distinct sets or reasonably distinct sets with a little margin for error. So an algorithm that had been given this particular data might say, oh, look, well, cats are small, smaller than dogs, and they have pointy ears, and dogs are on average a little bit bigger, and they have floppy ears. And so then you go and you test that theory against some data that you've had held out. So I pull out my test data. Uh, this is a corgi. And the algorithm will look at it and say, oh, well, it's got pointy ears and it's kind of short. Therefore, it's a cat. Unfortunately, that's wrong. A corgi is not a cat. A corgi is a dog. So then you go back and you retrain and you iterate until you get something that is reasonably good across a bunch of different data. So that's, that's fine for, for something that's visual. Uh, you're probably thinking, but there are much better features you could use for, for dogs and cats. You could say that cats purr and have retractable claws. But to be honest, a lot of tasks that we do in machine learning are sort of image based. And so they don't necessarily have the whole biological information. Like we could sequence the DNA of these creatures and figure out whether it's a cat or a dog, but that's often not the data that we have available to us. So if we're doing an image classification task, well, we get the easiest available data, right? You go to something like a Google image search or ImageNet and you search for dog and you get a list of pictures. You go to the same thing, you search for cat, you get a bunch of pictures and you put those into your data set and you train. Okay, so you do that and you turn the crank and the magic box of your algorithm says, oh, dogs are green. Wait, what? That, that doesn't make sense, does it? And so you go back and you look at your data. So here's a Google image search of cats. You can see there's lots of, lots of different colors. There's some stripes. And of course, because it's 2020, one of them's wearing a face mask. Yeah, that's uh, data is what it is. OK. Pretty reasonable, looks like a decent number, de decent collection of cats. And then you look at the dog pictures and oh look, I see a lot of green. So, and still a face mask because it's still 2020. Um, so yeah, what happens is that people who own dogs are more likely to be taking pictures of them outside in beautiful green grass with trees, with plants and people who own cats on average, more of them are inside creatures, so there's not so much green. And so that was good enough, given the thresholds of your algorithm, to say, all right, therefore, I don't really need to like look for facial features or like nose length or the way the body is laid out. No, I can just detect green pixels, and that's good enough. And if you have enough green pixels, then you must be outside, and therefore, it's a dog because algorithms cheat. And um, this one we can sort of blame on bad data. Well, clearly I should have used only pictures of, of creatures with a neutral background, or maybe I need to just remove the backgrounds from those pictures to get it to focus only on the part that I really care about. 
and uh, maybe I should train my algorithm so it gets a bad score anytime it uses something that involves the color green thereafter to try to steer it away from that. Um, but yeah, algorithms cheat. So the next story is one, pr probably my favorite uh, algorithmic cheating story, uh, which is a program called GenProg. So I worked with the team that did GenProg when I was a postdoc. And it's a super cool algorithm. It's a genetic programming algorithm, as you can maybe guess from the name, which means that it mutates code directly. So GenProg itself was used for finding, for fixing bugs in software. So you would take something that uh, had a bunch of test cases, so we've got a bunch of test cases. We pass all of the ones that we have, and then you would have a bug that uh, a, a new a new test case that you're failing. And the program would then go and mutate its its code, which would give you sort of different options. So we might generate one that oh well it it's failing a lot more test cases, but at least passed the one that we wanted. Oh, here's one that uh, that's passing a different one, and we'd sort of take those and rank them all. So you know, this one's got a score of three. This one's got a score of of one. Okay, well, we toss that one. That that one's obviously not good. And we take these two with a score of of three and crossbreed them until we get what we want, which is of course something that passes all test cases, and it works pretty well actually. Uh, they could get software fixes for a lot of bugs. Not everything was, was easy to solve this way. You had to sort of have the code elsewhere to fix it in order to be able to mutate it in. But um, it worked well for a lot of things. But I'm not here to tell you about the time it worked well, of course. We're talking about algorithmic cheating. So the thing that this did for one of the, for one of the runs was that your score is based on how many check marks you get, right? How many test cases you pass. Okay, so if I want to be sure of getting a really good score, I could spend a whole lot of time mutating until I pass all those test cases, or I could throw out the entire test suite, delete the directory, and then look, I passed all the test cases. Yeah, because, you know, we're going to say it. Algorithms cheat. And of course, to get it to stop cheating, you can protect the test suite, or you can choose to use, use only programs that don't have the, the instructions for deleting the test suite, or have the test suite run on another machine, put it in a virtual machine. There, there's 101 ways you could, you could fix it. But cheating is really part of what the algorithm is trying to do. That was a great solution as far as you'd given instructions to GenProg because it not only uh, passed all the test cases, didn't fail any test cases, but it was also super fast because it didn't have to run all those test cases. It was pretty much the optimal solution. And uh, yeah, because algorithms cheat. So why do algorithms cheat? they're designed for it. Um, a lot of, well, artificial intelligence as a concept has been around probably as long as we've been telling stories to each other. But algorithm, uh, machine learning as we currently use the algorithms and, and such right now has a lot of its roots in sort of the 50s. And so a lot of them were designed with very space with bigger space constraints than, than we have now. And so you would do things like make your neural net with only one or, you know, only a couple of layers because otherwise it would just get out of hand. And so it's built into a lot of the algorithms we use. It's built into the ideas of the algorithms we use right from the get-go. And even now where we maybe don't have that sort of, I can't build a model that's too big constraint, we have other constraints like speed. So if we were allowing Gen GenProg to optimize for, for performance, which was a thing that we were doing, um, then sure, deleting the test cases gave you a boost in speed. Basically, 
a lot of algorithms are built on the assumption that taking shortcuts actually will help you win, help, help you get the, the, the best or the perfect score. And that's just the way they are. That's why algorithms cheat. And I'm not sure that you can do much about it in, in that sense. And this has been true even from very early on in the history of, of artificial intelligence or particularly artificial life. So when I first started, one of the algorithms I was really excited about was from uh, was a system called Tierra. And this was maybe, I, I think it might have been the first artificial life system, but certainly one of the earliest artificial life systems. Uh, it had sort of a primordial soup of resources and a self-replicating creature. And so the person who designed Tierra said he made the first creature uh, 80 bytes long and thought, well, I didn't really optimize this. I, it should be able to get down to something like 75 bytes. And so he's got a little self-replicating creature and he lets it run with some copy function that's, that introduce some mutations and tries to, to get it to evolve to a better creature, a smaller creature in this case. And so he turns on the system and he goes off, maybe goes to sleep. And the next morning or the next day or whatever, uh, he comes in and looks at the system and he thought he could get from 80 bytes to maybe 75 bytes. And he wakes up and he's got a creature that's 22 bytes long. So that was pretty successful. It was pretty cool. Um, as he ran the system and sort of analyzed the stuff, he left this fairly open-ended and you saw a lot of interesting things. So one thing was that uh, his little creatures discovered sex, as in they discovered uh, swapping genes, swapping bits of, of code with each other for more optimal mutations. Um, they discovered parasitism where some of the creatures either took advantage of, of their peers, or he, they even found one which they described as, as having sex with the dead, where it would pull up um, genetic code from other creatures that had been killed but not yet reaped because of the way the algorithm worked and, and how the memory was cleared. And when the rules changed, new cheating appeared. So when he decided to make it so that it wasn't beneficial to be small necessarily and each creature got resources based on how big it was, then of course, a creature evolved that lied about its size and got more resources and soon took over the whole little primordial soup. Um, so even in a fairly open-ended system, we see stuff that kind of looks like cheating. I mean, there weren't really rules here. It's not, there's, you can't call it cheating in the traditional sense, but it's the same sort of deal. It's a shortcut. And it's not something we see only in artificial life. Um, our top tw story of 2020 is, of course, a virus, which is basically nature's favorite cheater, or least favorite cheater, as we're finding this year. Um, a virus is a little chunk of code that doesn't have its own self-replication, and so it coerces your own cells into replicating like crazy to, to populate. And it's super effective. It's very difficult to get rid of a virus as we're, we're uh, all being reminded this year. So why did this evolve? Pretty much because it works. Basically any system is going to have some sort of cheaters. And uh, I'm a computer scientist and a computer security person. So we usually talk about hackers and cyber criminals and thieves, but you could equally talk about politics. There's lots of cheating in politics, edge cases. You could talk about economics or the tax code. It's something that is sort of inherent to any sort of large system. If there's a benefit to finding edge cases in the rules, then someone's gonna find it. So, Let's go back to those three rules again. So your model is only good as good as your data, your data is always bad, and algorithms cheat. So cheating is 
easier with data artifacts. That's sort of what we saw in our first example with dogs was that the data artifact was that there was there was green grass in the background. And even if we removed the green grass, we might still have an artifact where there'd be things like the reflection of green grass in the eyes or on the highlights of the fur or whatever. It wouldn't necessarily work. But as I said, all data has some artifacts. And so you're basically, your machine learning algorithm is going to be really good at finding what those are and manipulating them in ways that may be kind of not what you were expecting. So an example that I heard about in uh, one of my grad classes was detection of oil spills. So it's useful to detect an oil spill early. It's much easier to clean up. And it wasn't clear to me from the example uh, whether this was just overabundance of caution or whether they were also concerned that some of the people who cause oil spills may be not as motivated as they should be to report them quickly enough and be, be prompt. But whatever the reason, we want to detect oil spills. So we feed in, we've got our satellite image data, we've got a bunch of cases of oil spills, we've got a bunch of pristine coastline and ocean, and we put those in and see what we get. So turn the crank, get the machine learning go, and you get some good results. And it looks really great until you look at it closely. And that's when they discovered that because all of the images from the satellites had date stamps on them and timestamps, uh, what the algorithm was actually doing was not detecting the, the shape of the oil spill or the way it reflected or anything about the oil spill at all. It was detecting the days that oil spills had occurred. So all of the test data in their first set had, was oil spills that, that pictures of the same oil spill on a single day. And so the algorithm, you guessed it, algorithms cheat, found the date stamp in the corner and figured out how to detect exactly the date it cared about. Not so useful, but you know, you strip the date stamps off the images and you, you, you go again. But you have to sort of think about this because this is the sort of problem that's gonna occur with other data. So one that I can think of off the top of my head is medical imaging also has date stamps, but has other properties that may or may not be, be uh, relevant to, to your task. So for example, it, in many countries, it's very difficult to keep data on children, especially medical data. So a lot of the data sets that include medical data for say cancer detection are gonna be mostly on adults. And is it possible that your algorithm is going to learn markers that are specific to adults that maybe aren't going to matter in children and make it harder for your algorithm to detect cancer in children? Yeah, that's, that's a possibility. And as we said, a lot of drug tests are, are done on men exclusively. There's a lot of opportunities for this to go horribly wrong. So a more personal example of something that's not medical is smile detection. So I first in encountered a smile detecting camera about 20 years ago at a conference. And um, it's not an unusual thing for people to have even now. Uh, so you train your, uh, your, your camera on a bunch of good examples of people smiling, yay. And then you train it to recognize a bunch of cases of bad photos. So things like someone has sneezed, someone has coughed, someone is looking the other way, you know, there's hair in your face, whatever. And so the, the, the camera can, you know, flash a little warning saying, hey, that might not be the best picture. And so you probably can't see super well through, through the webcam in, in, in my very, very dark workshop here, but um, I'm half Japanese and I have fairly long eyelashes. And so when I smile, it's very hard to see my eyes. So unsurprisingly, even 20 years ago, that camera said, oh, did someone blink? And didn't think any picture of me was good, which is kind of insulting. And I was actually 
extra insulted because I thought, well, you know, it's an Asian thing, it's a Japanese thing, but it was a Japanese made camera. They sh certainly should have had examples of people who looked more or less like me, right? That, that seems reasonable. And I don't know whether they didn't because they were using some sort of database that just didn't include that many people or whether the English version of the firmware, I was looking at this camera in Canada, I'm Canadian, um, whether the Canadian version of this firmware that uh, just didn't have the same training for, for the smell detection. Um, yeah, it was still kind of insulting though. And as well as being personally insulting that, oh, no picture of you is any good, uh, it's kind of racist. So I've been trying to keep this sort of talk on machine learning pretty light, but it's really easy. We, we, we can't really avoid bias even in dog photos. Avoiding bias in data that involves humans is much worse, so much worse. And it's a big problem. Um, one of the examples that, uh, one, a video that I really enjoyed watching is one that's not machine learning based, but certainly a human data needs to be more broad sense is the racist soap dispenser. So if you've never seen the video, uh, there's a gentleman who's trying to get soap out of the soap dispenser and you can hear him laughing because it's not working. So he puts his hand in, nothing happens, puts his hand in, nothing happens. And he laughs and he goes and he grabs a paper towel puts it on his hand, puts it on the soap dispenser, and poof, soap. So, as you may have guessed, he was a darker-skinned individual. I think the video said he was African. And um, yeah, it, the soap dispenser probably didn't have any sort of machine learning involved. It was probably just a simple light sensor, and it didn't trigger for darker skin. And uh, I've actually always wondered whether that was a problem because I never can trigger those darn things. Uh, maybe I should start using paper towel. And nobody meant it to be racist, but obviously they didn't test it on a wide enough range of potential users if that came up. And another example that doesn't even involve computers is, so I am 1.6 meters tall, the 5'3 in, in, in American. Um, so I'm short. I'm not like the shortest ever, but I'm sort of below average height by enough that it's not great to do things like shop for a car. Or as I discovered a couple of years ago when we were buying a house, it's really hard to shop for a house because every time I went to the kitchen of, especially of newer houses, I would discover that I couldn't reach above the lowest level of the cabinet. So this, these kitchens would have all this fancy, beautiful cabinetry and only like, the bottom six inches was useful to me because I'm too short and they put them all too high on the wall. And yeah, that's that's the thing that probably ever anyone who's tall or short has experienced. If you're outside of what people are expecting, that's that's a problem. And again, I'm kind of insulted by it. Certainly there's plenty of other short half Asian women around here. I can't be the only one who's looking for a house, but it is what it is. So here's an example that uh, really does use machine learning. So these are pictures that were posted to Twitter a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the gentleman on the right-hand side was, has, was the one who posted them. He's helping the gentleman on the left figure out why he couldn't use the Zoom's uh, replace the background uh, thing without it having erased his head. Super inconvenient if you wanted to have backgrounds. And they tried a bunch of different things. So they tried having sort of a more neutral background. They tried changing the lighting, trying to, to make sure there's a little more light on his face so you could see his eyes. And none of it worked. So after some frustrating time figuring out what the heck was going wrong here, he came to this conclusion. And can't read it so, so well, but uh, turns out that Zoom has a crappy face detection algorithm that erases black faces and determines that a nice pale globe in the background must be a better face than what should be obvious. So I don't know if it actually works exactly like that. And of course, 
probably neither does he since we don't have the inside of the algorithm. But uh, yeah, algorithms cheat. And that's a pr from what we know about how algorithms cheat, that's a pretty reasonable assumption that, you know, maybe it turned out that they didn't use enough examples of black faces when they did their training and their testing. And so the algorithm, rather than trying to detect facial features or head shapes or whatever, focused on the wrong thing, which was sort of, you know, a bigger contrast between you and a dimmer background, uh, sort of a big white globe was probably the face and should be good enough. Yeah, not ideal, but you know, Algorithms cheat. And in this case, the cheating comes out as a racial bias. And you can imagine that it would come out in other ways. If the algorithm was expecting sort of a face to be all one color, it might have trouble with people who have large birthmarks. If it was expecting two eyes, what happens when it encounters someone who's only got one or is wearing an eye patch? Um, it's 2020, we're all discovering that facial detection works really poorly with face masks on uh, because it uses parts that are, that are now covered. Um, some of the early stuff couldn't handle things like glare from lenses. Uh, many passport photos require you to take your glasses off and it's not for any reason about the human agents at the border, it's to facilitate machine learning on those things so that you have, again, look, neutral background, no glasses, try to minimize all of the, the things you can do what, that, that would produce forms of bias in your data set. So the, at least the good news is with face masks, we have lots of images to practice on now. But all of these types of cheating have consequences. So debugging why Zoom backgrounds don't work for you takes time. It's not a zero harm thing. It's okay, it's not apocalyptic or anything, but it often is the case that the people who are stuck debugging these weird behaviors caused by machine learning are people who are minorities, either socially or in that data set. And they're gonna encounter this again and again and again. It's really kind of dangerous. But you can also have more direct danger scenarios. So one of the big uses of machine learning that uh, people are talking about right now is for self-driving cars. So recognizing appropriate tra traffic situations and, and navigating through safely. But if your self-driving car has lots of examples of pedestrians standing at the side of the road and figures that, okay, well, it looks like a human is a thing that has a head and two arms and feet and is, you know, possibly very short as a toddler or, or as tall as an adult, that's great. So what happens if a self-driving car decides that someone who is missing a leg is therefore not a human and kill someone. Uh, I really hope that we don't have too many cases where, where people die in order for us to discover the flaws in our data, but um, it's probably, well, it's probably already happening. It's probably already been happening in medicine for years. And um, again, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to keep this light, but medical data is really terrifying. Um, and I'm in, I'm, I live in the US now and data on policing is really terrifying. There's a lot of stuff where we're, people are trying to use the data and, and you're like, well, it's real data, so it must be the right solution. But there's a lot of forms of bias that have been introduced before you even got to your real data. And without examining those thoroughly, uh, we're doing very dangerous work. But Let's go back to some examples that are a little bit more fun. So this is uh, this is an image that uh, was I saw posted to Twitter last month, I think, sometime, and um, it's very old. And the person who posted it said, 
if your big data person doesn't recognize this image, then you should get rid of them. And I had a laugh because of course I recognize the image, but this is Dr. Terry's masterclass on machine learning. You should not feel guilty for not knowing things. There's always opportunities to learn. So, and, and I like this one because it's kind of a funny story. I mean, in that it really illustrates something. So this picture of a plane is an aggregate of data of planes that had bullet holes. So each one of those red dots is a place where the plane was hit with a bullet. So this is a flight, fighter plane. I think it was World War II-ish. I, I don't remember the whole details of the story. But they were working to figure out how to make the planes not have so many bullet holes when they came back. So they looked at that data. These are where the bullet holes are. Clearly, we should put the armor in those places. And then the planes will, will not have these holes through them all the time. And that seemed pretty reasonable to everyone in the room until one person said, wait, no, we need to put the armor in the places where the dots aren't. Why? Well, if the plane has a bullet hole and comes home, then we have the data. But if it gets hit in one of those white places, clearly something goes catastrophically wrong. The plane blows up, we never see it again. So, you know, and, and you can sort of see where that might happen on this diagram. Among the things that, that don't have bullet holes are the engines. So I love this example because it sort of shows you how with exactly the same data, you can have completely opposite answers to the question, depending on mostly what question you're asking. So are we asking the question of how do we get fewer bullet holes in planes? Or are we asking the question of how do we make sure that more pilots come home safely? And so if you ask the how to make fewer bullet holes then, then you know, in the planes that come back, then you can put the armor right where, where those dots are. But if you want to keep the planes from blowing up in the first place, then you need to put the armor elsewhere. So, now that we've had this discussion about all the hilarious and, and awkward ways in which algorithms cheat and how much of an impact that can have, uh, you may be asking the question, how do I stop algorithmic cheating? But as I said, I, I put it on the rules for a reason. <laughs> I'm not sure you can. <coughs> Algorithms, cheating is basically inherent in the way we design the algorithms to find the fastest, the best, the most efficient solution. And I don't think there's a way to stop that, but maybe that's the wrong question. So maybe a more tractable a question that we can really actually work on is how do I get better results? So even if you know that inherently your algorithm is probably going to use any shortcut it finds, how do you make that work for you? So going back to those three laws, your model is only as good as your data, your data is always bad, algorithms cheat. So the first thing to do is to care deeply about the data. So you have to care about things like image quality, whether your data set of people mostly has pretty people, whether it has people of only some skin colors, whether it has people without missing limbs or birthmarks, whether it's your data has already been filtered through some lens of good. So for example, your Google image search is, is often based on, on page rank. Um, although I gave the um, last law of algorithms cheat, top billing in this presentation, there's a reason that there are three laws and the first two are about data. Trying to figure out what is good data is really fundamental to getting the machine learning to give you the results that are actually useful to you. And uh, I swear this is the, the, uh, the screenshot that I see most often in Python presentations. Uh, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. And I think it's because programmers are just like, 
really determined to go things alone and be able to solve entire technical problems by your, themselves. Maybe it's because we've built up a model where that that's that worked for us often enough that it's fine. But in machine learning, don't do that. Please don't do that. This is really something that's better as a team sport. So find domain experts. You know, if you if you're working with medical data, work with the doctor. If you're working with ecological data, work with the right biologist. Whatever. If you can't find that expert because it's weird data or you just don't have access to them, you know, find people who are used to dealing with data, uh, statisticians, psychologists, biologists, anyone who who's spends a lot of time looking at bias and data is going to understand this probably better than we are as a computer scientist, unless you're fortunate enough to have some background in other fields. Really, you want a whole team to be doing this. And you should be a little bit suspicious when you see stuff that's like coming out of a grand new startup that has like five programmers and no data scientists and no domain experts and doesn't say they're collaborating with anyone, maybe that's not really real results and maybe you should not be trusting that. And the data will help a lot, but there's also other things you can do. So there are many algorithms. You can choose one that has a better path that, uh, does does whatever way it cheats is more suitable for your data. Um, and if it chooses a bad path, as we saw with the, the dogs, you can always go and retrain and punish. Uh, we do this sort of thing all the time. And we do this sort of thing in the real world as well. So if you want, for example, you've got a bunch of students taking exams, you want to make sure that they don't cheat. You do things to manipulate the environment to make it harder for them to cheat. You move the desks harder apart. Nowadays, we do that just so we don't cough on each other, but you also do it so they can't see each other's papers. You might have a proctor watching the room or a camera, and you penalize them if they do get caught so that it's not worth the, the, the risk to people. And we do this for code as well. Um, anyone who has a, a, a open source project often has continuous integration tests so that when people give you code that doesn't comply with, with PEP8, or give you code that that causes breaks other parts of your pro your your entire test suite, then you can just reject it out of hand. And in order to get a good solution, they have to sort of play by those rules. Uh, one that uh, comes up for my field is bug bounties. So it's easy to sell a computer security bug in theory to on 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 the black market to people, but if you have a bug bounty program, then people can just go to you and get paid and they don't have to worry about any of that. And uh, they get kudos for it and it's good for the resume. And so we try to encourage people to do the right thing and not exploit the, the issues that they found. And so, well, in, in the name of Sailor Moon, you know, in the name of the moon, I'll punish you. It is totally fair to punish your algorithms and make sure that they are on the path that you feel is the most useful for what you're doing. So the other thing, of course, is that iteration is good. Um, I think iteration is really built into machine learning, but I don't think it's built into sort of the popular culture around machine learning. But so you iterate, you tweak. You didn't learn Python in and get it all right immediately. I know I'm still learning, especially this year, because now that we've been able to shut down 2.7, I finally get to learn how to use F strings properly. But um, you didn't get it right the first time. And tweaking and adjusting is, is really part of what we do. So sometimes you'll have to throw the model out. And that's that's just the way it is. That's That's fine. And sometimes you'll be able to retrain and rework. So how do I take advantage of algorithmic cheating? I'm a security person, so I always have two questions when I hear about cheating. One is, how do I stop it? And two is, how do I take advantage of it? So first, the easy answer. Um, we've just said that we need to be aware of sources of bias in our data. And we've said that algorithms cheat and use biases in our data. Look, these are two things that can go right together. You can use your cheating algorithms or a different cheating algorithm to help you suss out things that are potential shortcuts and see whether they're real shortcuts or whether they're 
sources of bias. It can help you figure out where you're lacking in your data or figure out what things need to be excluded or figure out a lot of other things. And I also want to note that cheating doesn't have to be a bad thing. Cheating may be what you want. I mean, there's a reason we built it into the algorithms. So this is a picture of the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge that ran at the DEF CON hacking conference. And um, in this case, they were using algorithms and programs to run a capture the flag contrast, trying to, to hack into things, trying to patch things and, and stay safe. And in this case, if you're trying to patch something, it's sometimes really useful to get a patch that, okay, it's not perfect, but it's good enough to stop the known attack and give you enough time to produce something better in, in, in behind the scenes. So I say this as a reminder that, that cheating is sometimes maybe not a perfect solution, but it's the solution you have by and large, you wouldn't be using machine learning on something where you had a perfect solution. You're, you're basically trying to come up with heuristics. So sometimes that heuristic is good enough as long as you're careful about where, how you deploy it. And uh, a quick shout out to my security folk. If you want to sort of understand cheating and be able to predict it more accurately, uh, computer security is the field for you. So uh, much like machine learning, uh, computer security has lots of tutorials and big contests. I, I mean, the DARPA one is obviously sort of an expert level one, but there's lots of capture the flags and security education that's aimed at beginners. And a lot of these things are just, you know, plain web games. You can, you can just play by yourself or again, it's, it's, it's a lot more fun with a friend. Uh, work together and, and, and learn a little bit. And really what the field of computer security does is we take beautiful, perfect models of how the world works and then try to find ways to subvert them in, in ways that are unexpected and beneficial to the attacker or equally subvert them in ways that are not beneficial to the attacker. So it's, um, I think that machine learning and, and security go really well together and, uh, Nobody's ever going to be able to convince me otherwise, but you know, it's it's a fun place to start. The last thing I really wanted to to focus on today is uh, being aware of the superficial truth. So machine learning is sort of telling you about the status quo. It's telling you about the data you already have, and it's lazy. It's it's going to give you the answer it thinks you want to hear. And so if your bias and the, the data's bias are sort of lined up, it's very easy for you to look at those results without looking at how they got there, but to look at the final results and say, oh yeah, that totally makes sense, right? I, I fed it some data saying that the sky is blue. It told me the sky is blue, we're done. And so it's be suspicious when, when it seems too perfect or that, Really, it's one of those times where it's great to have a larger team so there's more eyes on it who might recognize that, yeah, that's maybe not the right, the best thing. So going back to those three rules again, if your models is only as good as your data, then you should try to make careful and intentional data choices. If your data is always bad, you can try to actively seek out those biases and flaws so you can understand them, characterize them, and maybe deal with them in ways that are more appropriate than just whatever the machine decides is easiest. And algorithms cheat, so don't be afraid to punish them, to rework things, to, to focus specifically on areas of bias, and always check the work. It's, it's, uh, it's very easy to end up with a situation where you what what you get looks right, but how you get there is not so right. So if you're even if you're never going to do machine learning, what I want to remember to you is that it isn't a magic box where you turn the crank and you get insight. It's a magic box where you turn the crank and 
sometimes you get green dogs. So, you know, it's not really, you don't necessarily get insight until you look at the results. And it's very easy for, especially the media, to characterize machine learning as uh, like getting expert advice. So you go to the algorithm and it's like a magical oracle that tells you the, the perfect solution to everything given all of the data, the giant big data that we've looked at, and it's gonna be awesome. But it's not, that, that's not really what machine algorithms are like. They're more like the, 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 the person who looked at, you know, said, hey, uh, the government has told me that we're going, they're going to pay for dead snakes as part of their campaign to eradicate snakes. Um, what they wanted was people to look at that and say, oh, I should kill more snakes. But machine learning is more like the guy who said, oh, I could kill snakes or I could start breeding snakes and then I'd make a lot more money. <laughs> So yeah, be a little suspicious of uh, anything that claims it's perfect. And so in conclusion, go forth, have fun, do some machine learning, experiment with it. And when you're observing machine learning results, remember my three rules, you know, your models is only as good as your data, your data is always bad, and algorithms cheat. And uh, Really, when you're going to go do machine learning, make sure that the machine isn't the only one who learns something. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> so I guess I, I'm gonna take questions, but I don't think I can actually hear the moderator, so I guess I'm gonna have to read them. Yeah. So, so what's the best way about, to go about generating synthetic data? Um, it depends. It depends on what synthetic data you need. Um, I think that's probably a question that there are entire textbooks written about. And you pretty much, you have to experiment and you have to see what works and what doesn't for your particular application and for your particular algorithms that you're using. What I do to generate data for a neural net is probably gonna be different than I would for, a, for an A-life algorithm. So I don't think there's one answer. And in fact, um, one of the things that I, thought about putting in the presentation, but hadn't, was the no free lunch theorem, which is a fundamental part of, of the A-Life community, which is that there's not one algorithm that's actually going to work for everything. Like, I, I know we're all like super excited about neural nets, like it's the 70s again, but it's probably not the perfect algorithm for everything. And the same is true for, for generating data. I don't think there's the best way. Next question is, how should one prepare against unknown pitfalls that you're not aware of when building or designing a system? And that's iterate. Uh, be prepared to, to iterate as you learn. You're going to learn. Hopefully, you're going to learn before anyone dies. Uh, do a lot of testing. Be as broad as you can in that. And just be prepared. Just expect that there are going to be pitfalls and build them into your timelines and build them into your testing and your models. When learning, what learning track should a beginner should a beginner in machine learning follow in order to get good at it, especially considering ethical and bias aspect of it? So I don't know because, of course, I learned this so long ago that I haven't really looked at the beginner's tracks. And unlike in computer security, where where I train people on my job all the time, I don't train people in machine learning normally, so I don't know the answer to that. But I will tell you that. The best sources I've seen, especially about ethical and bias data, come from people who are directly affected by them. So you probably don't want to go to people who are super popular only to learn about how bias works. What you want to do is you want to talk to the disabled community, you want to talk to people of color, whatever minorities you have in your community, women maybe. That, Talk to people who are not the standard people in, the, in that field. And that's where you're gonna get the biggest insights, the fastest. And a lot of people, because they care so passionately about this, talk about it a lot. And so there's, there's lots of things out there. So just 
do a little bit more than just searching through the first Google results for machine learning, you know, try searching for machine learning bias and then a, a community name, you know, machine learning bias and disability, for example. So yeah, so that's all we have questions for you. So, um, so that was really a very impressive talk from you. Thank you so much for having you. Have a good day.